the thing I think we forget is that you and I have one life to live on this earth. Um, if you believe in reincarnation, it's awesome because we have more. <laughs> but right now, we know we have one. Mm-hmm. What are we going to do with our lives? Are we going to open our hands? Or are we going to clench our fists um, and try to cling to our own security? This is Lindsay Crinks. Lindsay is Education and Street Chaplaincy Coordinator at Open Table Nashville. Compassion is good for us. Bitterness sucks. Skepticism (laughs) eats us alive. Cynicism will rot you out. But compassion and kindness and generosity and justice, all of these things bring us life. Lindsay is inspiring to say the least. I was moved many times over the course of our conversation, and later she'll tell us about how hypergentrification in the city is affecting homelessness and creating increasing levels of economic stress in tenants. Oh, this is National Demystified. I am Alex Steed. In each episode, I talk with someone who hasn't been here in the city for all that long about a subject I'm hoping to look into further. That person this go is going to be Sarah Marshall, and I'll get to her shortly. Um, I then talk with someone who's been here longer and is an expert on that subject that I'm exploring. And in this case, that'll be Lindsay. We'll revisit her later in the episode. Quickly, please subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen. Consider giving a review if you can and sharing with a friend. We're on Instagram and Twitter at National Demystified. We're on the software equivalent of Fred Durst that is Facebook these days. And uh, if we could have a profile, I don't know, back on MySpace, I guess we would, but it's not that time anymore. If you have any feedback and you want to send that to me directly, or if you have an idea for a future show, you can reach me at podcast at knack-factory.com. That's podcast at knack-factory.com. Before we get to Lindsay, uh, we should introduce this week's new Nashvillian. I guess I should say fleeting Nashvillian. This is Sarah Marshall. I think I'm going to be wrestling against this the whole time because it's nylon. How would you describe what you're removing from your body (laughs) right now? (laughs) Um, This is actually a gift that I received as a bridal party present, which is... (laughs) called a knapsack NAP and it's a sleeping bag that has armholes and a hood and a head <laughs> hole. <laughs> it's I like, should add. <laughs> it's like it's like a gussied up version of a burlap sack <laughs> that you you cut arms and holes yeah. in. It's really comforting. This is Sarah Marshall. She's a writer. Uh, she has written some of my very favorite essays for The Believer. In the New Republic and BuzzFeed, uh, her subject matter ranges from Tanya Harding to Ted Bundy to the Satanic Panic to abortion access, all sorts of things. Uh, she's the host of an incredibly popular podcast called You Were Wrong About, in which her and her co-hosts deconstruct cultural phenomena that we may have collectively misremembered, and they go into why we didn't remember it correctly. How would you describe your living situation like how how do you occupy space i think my domicile is my car although i don't always have it with me because i travel around in a turquoise honda fit which Mm. currently has a dent in it from when i hit a raccoon recently which is the first (laughs) casualty of my traveling which i'm proud and humbled by um and I feel like I, I spend about a month in each place that I end up typically. I was just, and I don't plan that, but it's how it worked out, works out. So I was in Alaska for a month. I had planned to stay for a week and I was there for about a month. I'm going to be here for about a month. Uh, feel as if I'm operating in a kind of way of traveling that's sort of, I, there are people that I know in different parts of the country and they have households and, places up open up in those households where they would like someone to come and and be and I get to be that person. Sarah and I met on Tumblr in 2010 or so. Um, we bonded over a love of Freddy Krueger and having old dads. 
She is living at my house in East Nashville right now. She's researching the satanic panic, but she watched my dogs for a bit while I was traveling and she uh, uh, is sort of living here temporarily. I went in there uh, earlier to get um, to get the iron mm-hmm. and uh, um, you've set up like an altar. I know. <laughs> Which I don't do on purpose, but I was looking at it today because I've been researching the satanic panic and I'm just like, the only things that I own and take care of are like books on relatively dark subject matter and a bunch of candles and plants. And then I like arrange them in idiosyncratic permutations. And I'm like, all of my belongings are sorted now and they're in a weird altar and I, and I, and I live here. <laughs> I asked Sarah where her initial fascination with Nashville came from, and like so many things we both love, it began with a movie. Oh, and and by the way, there is going to be a substantial spoiler ahead for a movie that's been out for over 40 years. So once you realize what's happening, um, you might want to, if you're trying to avoid it, still skip ahead about two minutes and 10 seconds uh, uh, in case you want to miss that. I've had that bio for a really long time, but it's just here. It's only here when I'm living here that it makes sense. My Instagram bio is, this isn't Dallas, it's Nashville. They can't do this to us here in Nashville. Somebody sing, sing, sing. (laughs) Tax relief may never come. It don't worry me. Oh, she's so good. She's so good. So little. Um, (laughs) What is this from? This is from the end of Nashville which you and I need to watch because I haven't seen it in several years. Mm. But the way I remember it, um, spoilers, uh, you know, we've been following around all these Nashvillians for two and a half hours. And then Barbara Jean, who's the Loretta Lynn character, yeah. is at this big benefit concert and she's shot and they carry her off stage and no one knows what to do. And it's just like, and so Haven Hamilton, who's the guy speaking in that quote, who's this sort of like. It's like Porter Wagner. Is it? Okay, I yeah. didn't know that. But yeah, I think yeah. of it as just like big hairdo, like like very vain, like very sort of king of the show the whole time. He like suddenly understands that like someone, need, there need a gross, so we need a grown up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a grown up and like we can't grieve, like we all need to sing. Like if we don't sing right now, like we're gonna, the center is gonna fall apart. So we need to sing. And so Barbara Harris, who's been like wandering through the movie, just shell shocked and out of it and on something yeah. the whole time. Yeah. Just, you know, this is her moment. And she performs and she sings the song and everyone sings with her and it ends with everybody singing, which is like either the, like both, I think the most inspiring and the most damning thing. And she's singing, she's singing a song written by a vain piece of shit. Yeah. <laughs> Who we know to be a vain piece of shit. What the uh, Keith Carradine character. Who was just marvelously played by Keith Carradine. Yeah. And it's a song about just solipsism and narcissism. And it becomes a song that a crowd sings together. And just, and it is like, and and to me also is, it's like, I don't know, like at its worst solipsistic and at its best nihilistic. Mm -hmm. Right. But just like, and really it's like, there's no grownups and it's okay. (laughs) It don't worry me. Like so many of Allman's movies, Nashville is about so many things. It's about fame and vanity and image, but it's also about the tensions that brew in a changing city. The same character Sarah quoted earlier says to a session musician within the first five minutes of the movie, cut your hair, you don't belong in Nashville. So in preparation for talking with Lindsay Krinks about tenant issues and homelessness in the face of hypergentrification, I asked Sarah to talk about the development she's seen in her short time here. Okay, so we're on a cul-de-sac and there's, I think you said earlier, seven houses on each side, something like that. And so there's two houses, most of two houses at the end of the street that weren't there a week ago. Mm-hmm. And... 
people who were moving out of the house across the street yesterday and some ladies came by as I was sitting on the porch today to ask if the place, the other half of this duplex is for rent. <laughs> so we're like here at the moment that like this street looks different now than it did two weeks ago mm-hmm. and it looked different then than it did a month ago. Oh, and uh, a super quick update since recording this, uh, which was only a couple of weeks ago, uh, another house has been torn down and two additional houses uh, are nearly uh, built um, on top of the ones that Sarah described here. Yeah, I was, I've, uh, you know this, but I was, I was running the other day and I just found like a family album that, because like when they, there's, there's a, there's a great there's a great podcast episode about this from a, from national public radio mm-hmm. about just the process of tearing these houses down. And it's like, not, it's like if a, if a house, just the bank has the house, right. If the, if the, 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 the people who hold the paper in the house don't anymore and the bank takes it, mm-hmm. it's not beneficial to the bank to like go through and like collect personal <laughs> items and make sure it gets to the right people. They just tear the house down with all the stuff in it. And like, there's a literal debris of like people's lives just blowing through the street like family <laughs> albums like photos i've seen like dresses like i mean it's like a it's it's changing so quickly that the remains of the city are like mm-hmm. literally just blowing through the street i went on the porch watching the dresses go by i haven't seen any dresses yet and today i visited a friend from twitter who was staying in an rv park this week which is like also an interesting place to be Mm -hmm. this is someone who liquidated her life a couple years ago and now can fit it into an airstream Hmm. that's like there's something happening these days generally with real estate but that's neither here nor there no it's very here very here (laughs) (laughs) so very here in fact that that's what this very episode is about um the first Nashville Demystified is a production of Knack Factory and We Own This Town. Knack Factory is a commercial content video and photo production company with offices in Portland, Maine and Nashville, Tennessee, working with clients large and small from manufacturers of world-class baby strollers to groups that advocate for the land rights of fishermen. Uh, resonant, moving and concise visual storytelling is Knack Factory's specialty. You can find out more at knack-factory.com. And We Own This Town is a collective of podcasts produced for and by Nashvillians. I'm especially fond of Band Splainer, uh, which is hosted by Olivia Ladd, who's been on the show in the past talking about John Hartford. In the most recent episode, she dives into the illustrious career of New Order. You should check it out. So again, you heard from Lindsay Krinks at the beginning of the show, and you're going to hear from her again. One thing I want to say right up front about this is... We're going to get into homelessness and issues facing renters here in the city, and some of those issues are heavy, but damn, did I luck out on connecting with Lindsay. So for a person who has devoted her life or a a large chunk (laughs) of her adult life to working on some of the hardest issues facing the city, Lindsay speaks with light and joy in a way that's immediately inspiring. The prognosis for the issues that she's talking about is not immediately great, and she acknowledges that. But in speaking, uh, she manages to empower and inspire while also being incredibly real. Uh, Lindsay moved to the city from South Carolina in 2003, uh, and since 2007, she's been working on issues relating to affordable housing and homelessness. She says that the work she does includes different forms of outreach, organizing, advocacy, and activism. Uh, It also includes interfaith chaplaincy uh, when uh, she and the group she works with are literally burying those who are unable to make it off the streets. So again, it's real stuff, but incredibly worth knowing. And Lindsay is an uplifting joy to listen to. She works primarily with Open Table Nashville, which describes itself as a nonprofit interfaith community that disrupts cycles of poverty, journeys with the marginalized, and provides education about issues of homelessness. They do amazing work. Um, I encourage you to check them out. So uh, you don't need to hear any more from me. Let's get straight to Lindsay. So I moved um, to Nashville from South Carolina in 2003. And, um, you know, when I was in a, living in a small town, I kind of bought into the myth that people who are on the streets have done something to be there. They've kind of, they kind of deserve their plight. Um, when I got to this city, 
Um, and I started meeting people on the streets when I started seeing that there are not only personal issues um, that people become unhoused, but there's also much larger systemic issues, issues of justice, issues of affordable housing, issues of criminalization. When I started seeing that, I um, couldn't look away. You know, a lot of my friends were going on mission trips to third world countries. And when I realized the suffering that was in our own backyard and actually met the people and I really fell in love with them, and I was taken under their wings. Um, I started seeing a different side of the city and plunged myself into it. Um, one of the first groups I got involved with was the Nashville Homeless Power Project, and they were a group of currently and formerly unhoused folks who were organizing themselves around issues of affordable housing. They were incredible advocates, and I'm still connected to a number of those folks. So, I mean, affordable housing, I mean, there, there's so many different things we could talk about in this arena, and there's so many different things that I'm sure you've seen in the past 12 years that that uh, have rich stories and histories behind them. I, I'm, I'm curious, so from 2007 to now, mm-hmm. Nashville has changed a lot. Um, I, I, that that question mark at the end of that sentence is rhetorical. <laughs> sure. <laughs> In the past year or two, Nashville has changed a lot. Can you just can you talk about like what that that broader change looks like from a development perspective, and then what that has meant for for homeless people in the city? Definitely. So. Um, Nashville has experienced in the last 10 to 12 years something that a lot of people are now calling hyper gentrification. It's actually like ramped up gentrification. So along the urban core, along the first, second, third rings of the city, um, north, south, east, west, we're experiencing neighborhoods that are flipping. Um, There's a number of factors that gave rise to this situation. So we had some of the first luxury condos that were coming in Nashville around 2006 or so. You know, the the Gulch was starting to change. Other places um, on West End and around downtown were changing. And then the recession hits in 2008. And foreclosures just spring up everywhere. They sweep through the city, often through poor neighborhoods, often through black and brown neighborhoods, disproportionately affecting folks of color. And the bank comes into ownership of, you know, thousands of homes. So what happens from there is that a lot of those homes are sold off on auction, right? Mm. And these private equity firms and groups and corporations buy those at very cheap prices. Then they either flip them and ramp up the rent, so they're making a large profit for their shareholders and investors, or they're selling them off to other corporations who are going to do the same. Because at that point, housing isn't a public good. It's a commodity, Mm. a private commodity to profit from. So we see that sweeping across the city. And at the same time, you have this kind of exodus from the suburbs back to the urban core, right? Mm. So those factors are displacing tons of folks. And we go from, in 2000, having a 2,000-unit surplus of affordable housing to 2015 a few years ago when we had a deficit of 18,000 units. Hmm. So it's this huge flip, right? And we're projected to have a deficit of 35,000 units of affordable housing by 2025. Hmm. So this is a huge problem. There's a lot of factors at play. How does this impact the work? What does that actually mean on the ground for people who you're working with? So that means an increase in homelessness, right? We have families that have lived here for decades and generations who are being pushed out of their homes by rising property values. We found mothers in storage units with their children. We see families in cars all the time. We have more campsites in Nashville. And because of the over-criminalization of folks on the streets, people are moving out of Nashville and we're finding camps Um, further away from resources and further out those main corridors from downtown, right? So these are folks that sometimes die or get frostbite in the winter when people can't reach them or don't know where they are. It makes our work incredibly difficult, not only in reaching the vast amounts of people who are now being pushed deeper and deeper into the woods, further and further out of reach, but it's also really difficult to rehouse folks. So we 
one of our specialties at Open Table Nashville is helping people get from the streets to housing. But when you don't have housing units to put people in, and our people are literally dying on waiting lists, we're burying more people than we've ever buried before because they're just wasting away on waiting lists. Their bodies can't make it. Um, it's incredibly difficult, right? So it's, it's a pretty bleak situation. Um, we know that the fastest growing demographic of folks experiencing homelessness in the United States is children. Hmm. So this is affecting families too. And the folks that are elderly, disabled, that kind of thing. When you say uh, criminal, I think you said something along the lines of like criminalizing the population or criminalizing homelessness. Can you talk about what that means? Yeah. So a lot of folks were being moved out of their homes and onto the streets. And our downtown business district started making quality of life ordinances where the police would all of a sudden enforce not just criminal issues, but quality of life issues like sleeping in public, like obstructing the passageway, like um, public intoxication. You know, there's tourists and college students all over downtown mm. who are publicly intoxicated. Right. And the police would cross over those folks and not talk to them at all and find our guy that's sitting on the bench self-medicating the voices he hears because mm. he can't get the medical attention he needs in mental health care. And they'll arrest him for open container public intox. We ha we've seen a huge uptick in those kind of charges that aren't necessarily preventing crime, they're creating criminals. Because when people come out of having of jail from having those, um, those charges put on them, it's harder to get housing, it's harder to get jobs. And they're more in debt because what jobs they did have are gone. And, you know, they have all these court fees now. Mm. So it's a really, it, it's these overlaid systems of gentrification and development and displacement with criminalization. Right. We can't be proactive. We're reactive right now. And it's been incredibly frustrating because if we could be proactive and think five, ten years down the line, um, I think we could put some systems in place. But right now we're just doing damage control. Hmm. We're just trying to keep people from dying, literally, um, and keep families together, literally. Right. Now, when you say um – you said you were looking at this kind of work when you were looking at what 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 friends and, and peers were doing sort of for, for mission work and you were looking at what could be done in your own backyard. I know there are sub obviously substantial communities of faith in Nashville and there's substantial communities of people who just want to do something that's the right thing. You know? yes. And you make such a good point in that like this is an issue that is here and this is an issue that is like that is tangible and not, um, you know, it's not in the abstract. What are things that people can do, what are organizations people can support, how, how is this an issue that people can actually uh, engage in a constructive way? Yeah, that's a great question. There are so many different things people can do. We tell people how you treat other people matters on the micro level and the macro level. So the micro level is those interpersonal interactions you have with folks. Maybe you We've all had that experience where we're driving down the road and we stop at a median or we stop at an off-ramp and there's somebody asking for help, right? Um, just those small interactions of making eye contact and waving and maybe carrying extra socks or water or snacks in your car, um, even if you're not comfortable giving money, um, if you can have something to offer or even just a smile, that compassion matters. Um, on the next level up, it's supporting your local nonprofits. It's supporting not only the nonprofits that do the mercy and the charity work, but that are also doing the justice work. And with Open Table Nashville, we have structured ourselves. So we're not just trying to perpetuate, you know, a shiny nonprofit that looks really great from the outside mm -hmm. and is just doing charity work. We're trying to end homelessness. Like our goal is to work ourselves out of a job. So we're working on those policy issues. So finding nonprofits that are doing both the mercy and the justice work and then actually getting to know your council members and starting to follow some of this work. It's really easy to follow groups, advocacy groups like us online and respond to calls for action when we need you to email your council members. But, you know, our politicians are supposed to work for us, right? Mm, yeah. <laughs> it feels like a secret sometimes that they aren't supposed to work for these special interest groups or corporations. They're supposed to represent you and me and the people. So we decide whether or not they get reelected. So it's really important to be engaging them on these issues. 
we can only do so much at a local level um, in terms of our metro council. We also have to be organizing on a statewide level. Mm -hmm. And that's something our advocacy groups are working on. We just need people to be able to mobilize um, when we when we have those calls to action. So get a cup of coffee with your council member. Get a cup of coffee with your nonprofit leaders. Don't just tell them what you want to do. Ask them what they need, you know. Um, it's pretty easy to um, give up something small like that extra mocha that you were going to get and put an extra $5 a month toward a nonprofit like us. That really matters. Um, but building relationships, that's how things really get transformed, I believe. So volunteer too. Um, we know people have lives and they've got families and they're busy. But people can be a little bit more prepared and a little bit more intentional and this issue isn't going to end until we mobilize a critical mass to educate themselves, um, to organize themselves, and demand a different world. We know a better Nashville is possible, and creating it's possible. Um, we just have to prioritize it and do it. What does the state of development look like right now in the city? So the state of development right now is still pretty bleak. Um, you know, we just gave a huge tax incentive package to Amazon. So they're getting $17.5 million for their headquarters, about $15.2 million of some land work from Nashville taxpayers. And the, the thing that the city has sold us, so many of us on, is that this is going to be good for the economy, right? The problem with this model is that trickle-down economics don't work. Um, handing over our hard-won resources and our tax dollars to the wealthiest folks and then without any set of expectations or guidelines in place um, to say, oh, this will trickle down to us without anything in writing, without any major questions answered, that doesn't work. We look at cities like Seattle and we see Amazon's presence there and we see that rents skyrocketed. Rates of displacement, especially in neighborhoods of color, skyrocketed. Um, we see inequity soaring. They're like, they have the third biggest population of folks on the streets there in the whole United States. So we're asking so many questions about these development incentives. And we're saying, you know, the whole idea that the rising tide lifts all boats isn't working in Nashville, but it could work a lot better if our city had more checks and balances in place. You know, we've seen other cities, and we have one, what we call CBAs, Community Benefits Agreements. And that's like, you know, we have a major league, major league soccer stadium mm -hmm. that we taxpayers gave about $275 million to. Well, an organizing group called Stand Up Nashville got involved, and they said, we want a community benefits agreement with the major league soccer stadium because we want living wage we want 20% of the housing around there to be affordable. And we want a lot of other things, too. And they organized and negotiated, and they actually won a lot in that contract. Hmm. We don't have any kind of contract with Amazon or any other groups that we're giving tons of tax incentives to. Most people don't realize that tax financing is actually what made the Gulch such a luxury haven. Right. It was a blighted area, so they got tax increment financing to build a lot of that. Same thing with 505 luxury condos on Church Street downtown. They got $12.5 million of tax increment financing because it was on a blighted parking lot. Mm, right. <laughs> we Nashville can spend their money a lot better when we are holding our politicians accountable and when we're demanding um, equity in development. Development doesn't have to be a dirty word when it's done equitably, when it's done including the voices of people from the neighborhoods that are directly affected. Um, when checks and balances are put in place and we're not just kind of selling ourselves for profit, we're actually looking at the common good. It's a paradigm shift. And if Nashville is going to get its soul back, it has, to make a, it has to make a huge shift from profit being the bottom line to the well-being of our community, and especially folks at the bottom, because our city is only as good as, as it treats its poorest, which means we're really not doing right, very well right now. What happens in between those two places? Um, 
you know, things are things are developing fast. Like people might see what for them feels like an occasional uptick in rent, but it's actually sort of something much more substantial. Like what what does this mean for tenants and everyone in between ownership and and uh, uh, not having a place to be? That's a really good question. So tenants are affected in a whole lot of ways. And especially with that 2008 recession, we saw the rise of the tenant class and a huge decline um, of homeowners. Now there's more, the rise of the corporate landlord is here. And corporations and private equity firms own more of the housing stock than ever before. And they're, they have to answer to their shareholders. So they're ra- rising the, raising the rents and tenants can't do very much about it. And states like Tennessee, the laws are tipped in favor of the landlord. So, for instance, say you have a slumlord because maybe you got evicted from your apartment because a developer bought it and flipped it into a boutique hotel. Mm. So now you're living under a slumlord, and they refuse to make maintenance repairs. They can do whatever they want. Um, you can't withhold rent under the laws of Tennessee in order to get them to change things. So you've got to figure out your legal options. I have a family right now with mold and roaches, and they can't get their landlord to do anything. They can't move anywhere because hmm. there's waiting lists. So so we're seeing a lot of folks being disenfranchised from that American dream of building wealth through home ownership, right? And there's not a clear path on how we reverse that. We're also seeing huge rises in property taxes right now, right? So even some of the landlords that are trying to keep things affordable, they're strapped too and have to raise the rent because of increasing property values. That's part of that gentrification machine. And I get really frustrated. Have you ever heard people say, you know, but isn't gentrification good because it Mm. makes neighborhoods nicer and safer? Right. We hear that a lot. But what I want people to understand is that the term gentrification comes from the root word gentry, which is the ruling class. Mm. Gentrification is the return of the ruling class to take back the land and the property and the resources from the lower class, the peasants, the serfs. It always involves displacement. Development can be equitable or not. It's more of a neutral term, right? So we can have equitable development that raises that bar for everybody. That's not what we're seeing here. We don't have the checks and balances for that. So who ends up getting the short end of the stick? It's your tenants. It's your your people of color. It's your folks who are elderly. It's the marginalized communities. And that's an issue of justice. So we've got to do better on those things. Do you remember the first time that it resonated with you where people who are, people who are homeless did it isn't wasn't necessarily because of a decision that they made like oh this could happen really to to anyone yeah i want to tell you about my friend ken um he died several years ago but when i met ken he was downtown in a wheelchair and he couldn't speak and he couldn't walk because of a tumor growing on his spinal cord um i got to know ken cuz he wrote help on a piece of paper and he held it up to me And so we started writing back and forth on his paper. Um, And I would talk and he would write and I would talk and he would write. Ken grew up in foster care. He was beaten by his foster parents. He lived in a basement for a while and was confined down there. He um, finally found somebody that would kind of help support him. But, you know, from the age of nine, he was unhoused, moving through the foster care system and then aging out. He worked for a while and then health issues completely struck him down. He had no community. He had no family. He was born into this world without the safety nets that you have, that I have, that so many of us have. And he was a survivor. He wasn't just a victim. Like He was wheeling himself around downtown, asking for help and advocating for his needs. Um, he, I remember some of the early days he would say, I'm a nobody, I'm a nobody. He would write that down on paper. We kept saying, Ken, you're somebody. Like You matter to us. And finally, um, you know, he was put on hospice care about a year and a half after I met him, and we became his family and his community. We took him to his appointments. We set up the um, hospice care at his hotel. And by the end, he was writing down on his paper, I'm a somebody. I'm a badass. We were like, yeah, Ken, you're a badass. We love you, man. He was like, he found community through that. Um, 
the thing people don't realize is all of us are a couple tragedies away from horrific places that we don't want to think that we can go. Mm. I had another friend, George, who died recently, too. Um, his wife and kids were killed in a, um, in a crash. So a drunk driver um, hit them head on and completely killed his family. Mm. And he never was the same after that. He got in housing his last few years of life. But we just don't realize natural disasters, terrible tragedies, um, huge health issues when, you know, the health insurance thing is everywhere right now. Mm. These are issues that can affect all of us. Yeah, it's. I mean, I, I, I always wonder, including myself, like how much a reluctance to just look at you know, look at someone who is asking for help in the media and or or wherever you encounter people. Like I try to be as you know empathic as possible, but mm-hmm. but I wonder how much the um, tendency to avoid eye contact or avoid engagement is about avoiding your acknowledging how closely you know close to your reality that actually is. Yeah, we run from being vulnerable, right? Mm-hmm. We we try to um, secure ourselves and pack insulation around us in our lives. And what that insulation does too often is that it separates us from each other. We at Open Table believe our liberation is bound up with the liberation of the people that are cast out, literally. Like we cannot be free until people that aren't free in our city and in our world are free. And that causes us to work for collective liberation. It causes us when the temperatures drop um, at, in the coldest nights of winter, we're out on the streets doing outreach, getting people into shelters, um, calling the ambulance when we find people with hypothermia and we're building relationships because you know it's really easy to dismiss the people we see but their stories are so compelling and unique to each person we have no idea no idea what people have experienced so easy to judge a book by its cover but what i've found is that i've actually been transformed by my relationships with people who are unhoused and how radical they are in their hospitality toward each other. (laughs) I've seen more hospitality in our homeless camps in Nashville than I've seen in most of our churches. And I work in churches every day, um, work with the faith community. So, yeah. What would you, what do you want people to know that, uh, you know, maybe what you're most excited about with the work that you do or with, with the populations or the stories that you encounter, like, what do you wish more people knew, especially people who think that they have this thing figured out? That's a really good question. <laughs> Let me think. There's so many things. You know, I remember when I was a college student and I was literally planning to have a very comfortable life for myself. I wanted to be a physical therapist and have vacation time and have a good salary. And physical therapists are great, right? Mm-hmm. But that w- I was running from something else I was being called to. So I want people to know that they can make a difference. And I want them to do something about it. You know, if people are listening that have money, like, don't feel guilty about that. We want you to channel that into action and channel that into equity. Like, our society is inequitable, which means that we're not all starting off in the same place. Um so those of us who have more, more is demanded of us in order to work for equity and justice and be a human <laughs> like in, in this city, in this, in this world. We've got to do a little bit more. People can go online to opentablenashville.org or follow us on any kind of social media. We're everywhere. And um, we have newsletters and we keep people posted on calls to action and people can support as monthly givers. We also are always trying to point people to learn more about other groups like Stand Up Nashville, who's doing a lot of work on equity and development in our city. There's, with tenants that are struggling, we're really trying to point people to legal aid and the Tennessee Fair Housing Council right now. And, you know, the point is, if you're living in this community and if you're benefiting from the growth, like so many of us are, we have to be taking steps to give back. And you can do that in a lot of different ways. If you have money, give money. If you have time, give time. If you have both, give both. (laughs) If you have a big network, get them mobilized and get them involved. We'll do education with your group. Um, We'll meet you where you are and help you try to figure out that next step. But certainly, um, if you're benefiting, get involved. 
and follow us um, on social media so we can keep you posted. Excellent. Thank you so much for coming to talk about this. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me and thanks for talking. All right, everybody. Um, You did it. You made it through. Uh, Thanks so much to Lindsay for being on the show. Thank you to Sarah for doing that incredible impression of Hamilton from, um, from Nashville. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of Nashville Demystified. Thanks to Jesse LaFontaine for all things related to sound post-production. Hey, each episode has a show-specific illustration provided by my longtime friend Tim Burns. They are great. I want you to check them out. Look at the website. Um, I am pretty sure next week's going to be about the history of Hee Haw. Uh, if you have any suggestions regarding topics you want us to cover, get in touch in any of the ways the internet makes possible. Nashville Demystified is presented by Knack Factory, and we own this town. Thanks again for listening.